Wow, thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Good. I've got this uh, 59 minutes and 49, no, yeah, 59 minutes and 47 seconds left. It's counting down till it explodes and I disappear off stage. Um, welcome. So um, I'm going to start by telling you a secret. Um, it's in the opening chapter of my book when it comes out at the end of summer, but it feel, this is the first time that I'm going to say this publicly. Um, it's quite a moment for me, actually. I have a stammer. And um, I've had a stammer since, well, forever. And my mum took me to see a speech and language therapist when I was about seven years old. And uh, in those days, because I'm old, right, so that's, you know, back in the day, um, she told my mum not to, uh, not to worry uh, because I would grow out of it. And uh, I didn't grow out of it. I spent... Well, my teen years were pretty awful, actually. Every single speaking situation was uh, filled with dread. Uh, I hated the anticipation of speaking. I hated the speaking experience itself. And I had bad ruminations and memories of the experience afterwards. And then, um, I was about 22. I just had, a, had an awful final year presentation as an undergraduate just started my master's at York and uh, had this dawning realisation that I wouldn't grow out of it. Uh, before I say a bit more about that, um, you might be wondering why I'm telling you this. It's a kind of bit of, you know, th it's a kind of, uh, it's a therapy session for me. Um, <laughs> uh, and that's helpful, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I'd rather you didn't laugh, but that's fine. Um, <clears throat> so, um, the thing about a stammer, and this is going to be a theme of much of what I say in the next 58 minutes and two seconds, is... Um, it's a very attention-seeking condition. If a stammerer stammered on every sixth word, that would, that would be fine. They would soon stop paying attention to it, and the person listening to the stammerer would stop paying attention to it too. Uncertainty is very attention-seeking. It grabs your attention because you don't know when you're going to stammer next. It causes considerable anxiety, much of it below the surface, even when a stammerer is fluent, in inverted commas, they're still worrying about the next episode of stammering. So, I'm going to come back to that in a second. I'm 22. No, I'm not 22. <laughs> Actually, I sometimes fool myself I'm 22. I felt like I was 22 last night when I was drinking loads of vodka at an event. Um, I feel 122 today, by the way, uh, as I'm trying to sober up. Um, but, um, so I'm 22, and uh, I realise that I'm not going to grow out of this stammer. And I go and see a speech and language therapist in York. The world had moved on a bit by then. And um, she taught me controlled speech, which basically meant that I spoke like this, and I said, my name is Paul Dolan. Now, when you're very impatient and hyperactive, <laughs> that's not very helpful. Um, but, but it did actually help me um, realise, actually, it made me realise that I could speak fluently, or at least not stammer on those words that I used to find problematic. And from then, I pretty much put myself in situations where my speech was under test. I did public speaking, got a lectureship, started giving public talks, not of this size or scale, but, you know, started um, putting myself in situations that I found fearful, frankly. And an important insight there was things were never as bad as I imagined them being. And that's actually quite an important happiness insight, by the way. Um, much of our worries and concerns and fears and anxieties and misery comes from what might be rather than what is. And things often, actually most of the time, turn out to not be that bad. And so that pretty much takes me up till I'm 40. And, and, I've, and I, the only... Um, situations of, fl of, of uh, flight rather than fight um, were TV and radio broadcasts. Anything that involved speaking live was off limits. And I realised that uh, I needed to start doing more of that. And so I went to a conference in Croatia on stammering and um, very fortunately met two speech therapists from the Michael Palin Centre on the way back home. Now they specialise in speech and language for children, but they very kindly offered to see me. And all of the therapy, essentially, was not about speech therapy at all. I saw them for about six months, and it was all about reorienting my attention. It was essentially a CBT intervention, but it was about paying less attention 
to my stammer, and the realization, actually, that it didn't matter that much. That people weren't judging me as harshly as I thought they would be when I stammered. And that its impact on my fluency, and that's why I kind of put that word in inverted commas earlier, um, was largely unaffected by it. People just thought I spoke in an idiosyncratic way um, with an East End accent. <coughs> um, and so much of my improvement in happiness and well-being was due to the fact that I withdrew attention from my stammer, that I withdrew attention from something that was making me miserable. Now, here's a really, really basic insight. If you want to be happier, pay attention to things that make you feel good and withdraw attention from things that make you feel bad. Attention is the glue that holds our life together. Now, it's very interesting, you see, when we use the word pay attention, that's no, that isn't by accident. When you pay attention to one thing, you're necessarily not paying attention to something else. It's a scarce resource. And so to be happiest of all, you need to allocate attention optimally. I'm just going to grab some water. So that's the personal backstory. The, um, now, what's very, actually, what's very interesting, by the way, the reason, one of the reasons I was very nervous about saying that at the start was because it's drawn my attention and everyone else's to my stammer. So all of the, spe all, all, all of the speech, all of the talks that I've given in the last couple of years or so, two or three years at least, have pretty much every single one of them been perfectly fluent. You'd have to be, I think you'd have to be a very highly trained speech and language um, therapist to notice, any, that, notice that I had a stammer. And so that's why publicly broadcasting it today was quite a thing, because I knew, I was, well, I was pretty confident that by drawing my attention to it and yours, I would stammer more during the course of this talk. Something that was previously in the background is now in the foreground. <clears throat> so my professional interest in attention um, came about from working with, um, with um, Danny Kahneman in Princeton about a decade ago. I was, I was very, very lucky. I mean, that's actually um, uh, people that do well in life are just basically lucky. Um, and, and I was lucky to have met Danny at a conference in Milan about uh, a decade or so ago. And he invited me to Princeton. Of course, I said, no, why would I do that? Um, I said, yes, please. And, um, and as many of you will know, Danny is author of Thinking Fast and Slow, has a Nobel Prize in economics, um, is a psychologist by background, and has kindly written the foreword for my book. So kind of a bit more optimistic about sales now. Um, <coughs> 500 words from him, 70,000 from me. It's not much of a choice. Um, <coughs> so um, he, he uh, drew my professional attention to the idea that Actually, not just our behavior, I'm going to say a bit more about that shortly, but our happiness and our well-being is explained in terms of attention. So the, the insight that I have being trained in economics um, in the book is to say that when we've previously thought about what things make people happy, you know, you, you hear the stuff, does money make people happy? Does being married make, make us happy? The question really isn't, from the input, money, marriage, to the output, happiness. But it's mediated through a production process of attention. Money would make you happier if you spent a lot of time thinking about how rich you were. The key question then is not, does money make you happier? But how much attention do people pay it and what effect does it have on their well-being? So just like a company that's producing widgets, it doesn't just take land, labor, you know, uh, and, and produce the output. Well, it doesn't just get to the output. It has to produce the output. So a company can produce more widgets by having more land, labor, and uh, input. But importantly and critically, it can also produce more widgets by having a more efficient production process. You can be happier from having more money, more sex, stammering less. 
<laughs> Maybe while you're having sex. I don't know. <laughs> um, that hasn't happened to me, by the way. I was just like... Um, <clears throat> I know at some point I completely lose track of what I was going to say. <laughs> so, um, you can be happier by having more of those good things and less of the bad. But critically, you can be happier by paying more attention to more of the good and less attention to uh, the bad. So, with the same money, with the same sex, with the same stammering, you can be happier by allocating attention more efficiently. That's the, that's the key and basic insight. Now, <coughs> um, what can we say about attention? Well, it is a scarce resource, and so therefore you need to allocate it optimally. But as well as conscious attention, I mean, I've kind of used, I've almost implicitly assumed in, in what I've said that you're making a conscious decision about where to allocate attention. But actually, what the, um, the lessons of the behavioral sciences over the last two decades have taught us, from economics, psychology, neuroscience, and really brought together in thinking fast and slow, is that most of what you do simply comes about rather than being thought about. Much of your behavior and your well-being that follows from it is influenced by unconscious and automatic processes and not just by conscious thought. And so, as anyone that's read um, Thinking Fast and Slow will know, Danny, Danny uses the term System 1 and System 2. Um, starting with System 2, System 2 is your Mr. Spot brain. Uh, this is the this is the thoughtful, effortful, slow bit of your brain. The bit that if I asked you what 17 times 28 was, would, would, would have to work that answer out effortfully, slowly, and probably get it wrong. And it's the bit of your brain that you think drives most of your behavior, because it's the bit that you've got conscious access to. You're paying attention to conscious reasoning, and therefore you think that's what you are paying attention to in every choice that you, that you make. But Actually, most of what you do is driven by system one. System one is your old, evolved reptilian brain. It's the bit of your brain that answers two plus two without even thinking about the answer. Four just popped into everyone's head without you, with, without you having to do so. It's effortless, it's fast, it's automatic. You make between about two and 10,000 decisions every day. Most of those are unconscious and automatic. And in fact, what you'd like to do, <clears throat> because the brain is inherently lazy, it wants to conserve attentional energy, is that what you'll do is you'll try to get what were previously system two effortful decisions encoded into habits in system one. Your brain wants to automate processes where possible. So it explains why you'll go back and check whether you turn the oven off or whether you've locked the house. Or explains why actually um, you might have the same journey to work every day, but one day have to go somewhere else and you find yourself halfway to work before you realize that you're on the wrong bus or train. <coughs> system two is encoding into system one habits that make life easier for you. Um, as my friends remind me every time they uh, see me on the Horizon program, I said your, your brain would literally explode if Mr. Spock had to make every decision. So um, it's, it's, it's efficient that you encode things in system one. It's efficient that unconscious attention drives a lot of our behavior. So again, actually quite an obvious insight, really, I think, but not obvious if you read uh, many of the books on happiness. If you're, going to be, if you're going to be happier, you're not going to be happier just by consciously thinking about where to allocate attention. You're going to be happier by thinking about how to design environments that make it easier for you to be happier without having to think too hard about it. You can be happier by design, hence the title of the book. You design environments, situations, and contexts that make it easier for you to be happier without having to think about it. And just let me, let me give, I'm sure you've, many of you have heard these kinds of examples before, but let me just give you a few examples of where Unconscious attention drives our behavior in ways that clearly by, that, we don't, that we don't know about. So um, an example that my students are bored of me uh, telling them is if um, there's one study that shows if you walk into a supermarket and you're choosing between French and German wine, you know, the obvious, that, that might actually be quite an obvious choice. Um, but um, if French accordion music is playing in the background, you're more likely to buy the French wine. And if German beer keller music is playing in the background, 
remarkably, you're more likely to choose the German wine. Now, importantly, when people come out of the store and you ask them why they bought the wine they did, only I think 17% of people were even aware of music playing in the background. And no one thought that the music influenced their purchasing decision. So, we're poor, we, 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 with our system to insights, we, 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 don't, we, we, we can't observe the unconscious processes that drive our behavior. Um, we're doing a study at the moment um, in a hospital in London where we're increasing hand washing rates by pumping citrus lemon smells through the hospital. The prime of clean smells makes it more likely people will clean their hands. Again, if you ask people why they wash their hands, they give you a very nice post hoc system two response to it being the right thing to do and hand hygiene matters, unaware of the fact that that behavior is influenced by, determined by largely unconscious and automatic processes. So you're only going to get so far by thinking yourself happy. And actually, if you read um, any self-help book, it will basically tell you things like, be positive, think positive. <laughs> yeah, no shit. I, kinda, I, didn't, I didn't kind of work that out. Um, how do I do that? And of course, you don't know how to do that. It makes you more miserable, and you buy another self-help book. <laughs> <clears throat> by the way, I should just say that... Um, my book is, isn't a self-help book. Um, <coughs> well, kind of. So I'm, I'm actually going to give you, for, uh, for this talk this year, Peter asked me to come and talk here. I said, great, can I, can I come this year before the book's out? And you can pre-order on Amazon. Um, or, or can I come back next year when it's out, and then I can do the signings? So I'm going to do part one of the book, which is the sort of more academic-y bit today, and then, you, and then save, save up the self help bit for next year. You have to leave audience wanting more. Scarcity is a you know important part of of, of uh, sales, so um, so so uh, where was I? Unconscious attention. So um, you need to think about how to design environments in ways that make you uh, happier. And 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 I and I'll, and, and I'm going to say much more about that next year. <laughs> <laughs> <So> <clears throat> now let me uh, let me now turn. I am actually very keen to take. Uh, quite a few questions uh, insofar as you might want to ask me them, because I, think, I always think that's the most stimulating and interesting bit. Um, so let me, uh, let me move now to um, what happiness is, because I've, I've, I've used the term a few times, and I haven't defined it. And I've found it quite troubling, to say the least, in um, academic papers, let alone books on happiness, where we, people just loosely use many terms, happiness, life satisfaction, well-being, as if they're interchangeable and we all know what they mean. And they're not interchangeable and we're very unclear about what they mean. Most of what we think we know about happiness, whether money makes people happier, whether being married does, comes from evaluations of life satisfaction. Basically, people are asked very global questions about overall how happy are you with your life nowadays or these days, whatever. <clears throat> and you sit in your rocking chair, and in about five seconds or less, you say seven out of ten. Um, or if you're crazy, you might say eight. Actually, if you're crazy, you say ten. You don't want to trust people that are ten out of ten. <laughs> Can anyone be perfectly happy? Um, <clears throat> so there is a challenge with those questions. Well, first of all, Overall, how satisfied are you with your life takes a few seconds to answer. It's unlikely that people are really consciously thinking about overall how satisfied am I with my life nowadays. That's actually quite a very effortful thing to do and will take you a very long time. It will take Mr. Spock a long time to answer that question. Um, but importantly, um, I think those questions are also constructions. You ask me the question, I'll give you an answer. But that's not a question that I routinely carry around in my head. Thankfully, I don't spend much of my life going around thinking overall how satisfied am I, am I with my life these days. Those evaluations are constructions and actually can misguide us about the things that make us happy. Let me give you a little story um, about that. Um, I was out for dinner with one of my friends uh, 
some time ago, actually, uh, before the, I finished the book, because it's made its way into the book. And, and, and she, she worked at the time for, uh, what shall I say, a prestigious media company. Let's call it Media Land. And um, she complained the whole of the evening about her boss, her commute, her colleagues. Pretty much everything to do with the experience of her job. And then at the end of dinner, without any hint of irony, she said, of course, I love working at Media Land. <laughs> <coughs> now, there's actually no... Um, uh, that's not surprising, because um, on the one hand, she was explaining her experiences, what Kahneman calls the experiencing self. Day-to-day, moment-to-moment, the pleasures and pains of her job. On the other hand, she was giving me an evaluation of how well she thought she liked her job. And how much she thought she liked her job was a construction of a story that she told herself about how happy she was working at Media Land. Media Land was somewhere that she'd always wanted to work, and therefore, how could she not be happy having the job of her dreams? And so much of our lives, all of us, so much of our lives are, living in, are, are lived in stories. They lived in narratives, they lived in evaluations of the things that we think ought to make us happy. Either because some social construction tells us that, our parents have told us that, it's what we think should make us happy. Without paying enough attention, attention again, absolutely critical, without paying enough attention to the moment-to-moment, day-to-day experiences of those stories. When you pay attention to the moment-to-moment, day-to-day experiences, you sometimes get a very different answer. And one of the critical ways of being happier is to get feedback from your experiences. To give less voice to the stories. I mean, sometimes the stories and the experiences will you know, give you the same answer, but many times they won't. So I'm, I'm saying that what we should do is think about happiness not as a global evaluation, but as day-to-day experiences of pleasures <coughs> and pains. Now, um, that's nothing, there's nothing new in what I've just said. In fact, Kahneman makes that case towards the end of Thinking Fast and Slow. What is new is what's coming next. <clears throat> I think alongside experiences of pleasure and pain sit experiences of purpose and futility. That not only do you experience emotional, hedonic states from what you do, but you experience what I call a broader set of sentiments associated with how worthwhile, how meaningful, how fulfilling, um, how futile and pointless our activities are. And um, again, you know, our kind of academic research, or at least you know, some of our um, academic research is influenced by personal experiences, and, and um, about a decade ago, when I was in Princeton, I was thinking about, you know, would, it, would, would, a, happy na- would a happiness maximizer have children? Now, leaving the biological imperative to one side, would a happiness maximizer have children? And the answer is, uh, well, probably not. Um, children are at best neutral um, <clears throat> in their effects on happiness. And so, it was probably as someone who thought of himself as a happiness maximizer, probably wasn't worth it. Well, I thought, well, would ch- could children make me differently happy? Might there be something in the experiences of having kids that, um, that, made, that made those activities feel meaningful and purposeful, if not pleasurable? Um, and so, with a big, good dose of cognitive dissonance, I had kids, and, and I think it's been borne out. I think, I think, of course, I've got... 18 years of the misery that they're going to bring us, so I kind of have to tell a story about this somehow. But I think, I think that um, much of what I do with my children, reading, reading to them, them reading to me for the same story for the eighth time, um, is not particularly pleasurable, and I would rather, much rather be in the pub. But it does feel purposeful. And it does feel purposeful in the experience, at the time. Now, no, this isn't, a, this isn't a construction. This isn't a big meta idea of does my life have meaning. 
It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an experiential account of purpose. So that's my original contribution, is to say that, um, that alongside experiences of pleasure sit experiences of purpose, not in evaluation, but in experience. Now, there, there are many things that you uh, would do in life that um, may not feel pleasurable, but do feel purposeful. It explains a lot of motivation of human behavior. Um, it explains a lot of the, um, yeah, you know, the things that we do, those of us, those of us that exercise um, a lot. There's nothing, there's nothing particularly, well, there's something pleasurable about um, lifting weights in a gym and, 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 and feeling the pain of that. Um, but when I weight train, it, feel, it, it feels like it has purpose. And it feels like it has purpose when I'm lifting that next set of weights. And that activity, actually, I've been training uh, for quite a while now, and the, that, that ex those set of experiences have become increasingly purposeful in time. So I think if you, if you continue to do something, one of the motivations for doing it, and the experiences of feedback that you get from it, is that they feel purposeful. So a happy life is one that contains a good balance of pleasure and purpose. Um, again, informed by, it's like, feels like a kind of therapy, this is a real therapy session. Um, in, a lot of it informed by personal experience. I, I um, come from a, a, you know, a, a kind of bog standard working class background, if you like. And uh, I, had, I had a lot of experiences of, of family and friends that had lots of pleasure in their lives, but not a great deal of purpose. And now I've become an academic. And uh, it's, the, it's, the, it's the other way around. Um, lo lots of purpose in, in lives of academics at LSE and elsewhere. Uh, but they, I think they could be happier just by having a little bit of fun once in a while. <laughs> so, so happy lives, um, and, you know, it won't kill you. And if it does, at least you die happy. So, um, but um, a lot of, so, so all of us, I think, are happiest when we have a balance between pleasure activities and purposeful ones. Not, not the same balance, and not in equal measure, but a balance between pleasure and purpose that's fit for us. Some of us will be more pleasure machines, others more purpose engines, but the happiest lives are those that have the right balance between them that suits, suits them, that suits each individual. And we can inform some of this from data, um, we have now, we've looked um, at uh, a couple of data sets, some of it that we've um, got ourselves through studies that we've carried out ourselves. Um, other data coming from an American Time Use study, it's about 13,000 people in the US who are asked to, um, excuse me, from three randomly chosen activities during the day to say not only how pleasurable those activities are, but how meaningful they are too. So we can start looking at the ways that people use their time that bring them the most pleasure and the most purpose. So, um, uh, going to well, actually being at work, relatively purposeful, not particularly pleasurable. Watching television, relatively pleasurable, not particularly purposeful. So, actually, insofar as people go to work and come home and watch telly, it's not kind of such a silly thing to do. Um, commuting, neither pleasurable nor purposeful. Volunteering, pleasurable and especially purposeful. So, informed with evidence we can each start thinking about how best to use our time. And that just leads me to my final point, time. This has all been done seamlessly, isn't it? It feels like it has. Uh, it's all just like a stream of consciousness. But um, time, time is the scarcest resource of all, right? We're now half an hour closer to death than we were when we, when we came in this room. And you're not going to get that time back. You can beg, borrow, and steal money, but you're half an hour closer to death. Now, now, you've clearly chosen to allocate your time incredibly wisely um, <laughs> by being here. It's not so obvious I have, but you have anyway. You've made a really good decision to use your half an hour or an hour in this way. But it's, really, it's actually quite surprising. I, I, having spent a couple of decades going around Whitehall and elsewhere, um, there are very few policymakers that actually really seriously think about and talk about time use. Um, we, we, we often talk about big things that we can change in policy, big structural, systemic changes, changes in people's life circumstances and events. But actually, at the, at, at the margin, the reallocation of time is something that as policymakers and as individuals, we have a bit of discretion over. Of course, a lot of our time is pre-committed, but we actually have a, more time than we, than we think we do. Um, you know, I, I go to the gym, I choose to spend those four out of those four by one hour sessions in the gym each, each, each week. I do that pretty much every week. I think I'm busy. I've got a you know, good job and the kids and everything else, but I manage to find time to do that because I prioritize it. 
Um, it brings me pleasure and purpose. So um, we, we, we each can think about and should think about how we allocate this scarcest resource of all, time. So on that note, I'm going to stop talking. It's about half an hour that I intended to talk for, leaving half an hour for Q&A. Thank you very much. <clears throat> You better ask questions, by the way. <laughs> well, actually, I don't care now. Actually, I'm, I'm done. I can't, I'm, I'm meant to actually um, direct the mic, so I can't, I, it's really difficult. I've got, so I've got a hand, I've got a hand waving up in the corner there. Are they, uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah, thank you. Hello. Um, <laughs> There's actually people here now, I can see that. <laughs> I, I couldn't see that before, <laughs> I was talking to myself. Um, in, in international surveys, Denmark always comes out as being the happiest country, and yet superficially, Denmark and the UK are really quite similar. I wonder if you could offer an explanation. Yeah, so um, again, let me just return to my distinction between evaluations and experiences. Those lights are bright. Um, you, um, we, um, what we know about international comparisons of data nearly always, in fact, I think always, based upon evaluation. So overall, how satisfied are you with your life? Um, so, uh, so an interesting question will be whether if you ask people on a more experiential basis, accounting for pleasure and purpose as people go about their daily lives, whether Denmark and the UK would be that different. Um, but one of the explanations for, for why the Danes report high life satisfaction is when you, when you ask questions about what people think are the most important determinants of happiness, I think the Danes are the only country to put love uh, as, the f as the first most important uh, thing. Um, and countries that put money and income uh, um, you know, at the top or high, tend to report lower levels of life satisfaction. So that might be one explanation. Yeah. Um, do, do you want? I, do, does the do the mic holders just want to kind of pick people? Because I, I feel like I'm then doing a disservice if I if I don't pick someone. Maybe you could get their question from them first, so I can decide whether I want to hear it. Uh. <laughs> Hello, that was a brilliant talk. Thank you very much. But Excellent. Right. Next. Okay. So. <laughs> next. Hang on. Come back. Um, Considering that the UN has um, highlighted the fact that suicide is the third highest cause of death in adolescents, mm. and you talked about policy making, how mm. do you believe that um, theories of happiness can improve that statistic for adolescents? Yeah, Im to improve is it by that? making it lower, well, presumably. Yeah, yeah. Lower it. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just want to be clear. Um, <laughs> well, I think. What behavioural science teaches us, I think, is that we're, we're, we're special, but we're not that special. I mean, we each think we're different from one another, and we are. We have a different set of preferences and things. But um, actually, we're, we're quite similar too. And social connectedness, for example, is something that all of us want. We're social animals. We're, we're wired to be uh, with other people. Even introverts like being with other people. They just like choosing who those other people are. Extroverts don't care. They just like showing off in front of people. Um, <laughs> So, so I think the social connectedness is clearly a, a critical issue, and and f and feeling feeling worth worth it. You know, I mean, you, you'd be unlikely to commit suicide if you felt that the people around you would care and actually mattered if you did. Um, I mean, social media. I haven't spoken about social media. I talk a lot about social media next year when I come back. Um, <laughs> it's really good about doing it in these two parts. I can just start talking about that next year. Um, uh, and um, there's clearly a lot of there's much more interaction that now takes place. Um, in use and uh, uh, in social media, and that's not always good. And a lot of the reference groups that people have are defined on the internet, and um, the, that can be great, but uh, I think some of the negative effects of cyberbullying and so on um, uh, are, uh, are things that we should be taking much more seriously as public policy makers. Thank you, thank you for the question. Yeah, Thank you very much for that um, uh, very nice talk. Thank you. I don't know whether you read the study by, uh, by Times Magazine but in 2005, mm. when they went around the globe trying to find happiest and uh, unhappiest people. Mm. And uh, Philippine uh, people were the happiest. And the family they chose, they, the, the head of the family didn't have a job. They were eating off the uh, food thrown by other people thrown away. The unhappiest people were in Russia for some reason. Mm. So money uh, aspects and uh, whether money makes people happy. And I think USA, USA <coughs> came about seventh 
and you came about 17th. So if you can comment, I don't know whether you read that study or not. Yeah, so I'll just comment on, so on, on a couple of points. I mean, um, first of all, on income. Again, the, the evaluation experience distinction matters. If we, if we ask people how satisfied they are with their lives overall, then happiness is always increasing in income. It slows down when you, know, you get big hits of happiness when you're poor um, but, and, and you earn a bit more money, but you get much you know, smaller hits when you're rich. In the experience data, um, that is moods, you know, day-to-day -day moods, um, some data from the US uh, suggests that once you earn beyond about $75,000 a year, there are no returns to, um, there are no happiness returns to income. Um, so it doesn't, ma it doesn't matter how we uh, measure it. And I think what happens, of course, when people say how satisfied they are with their lives overall, one of the things that probably pops into their head is how much money they have, um, which, 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 much, which may matter much less in day-to-day -day experiences. Um, but the other s significant point um, is to say that, of course, when we're looking at other people, we're paying attention to something about their lives. And we think that the things that we're paying attention to when we look at them are the things that they pay attention to in their experiences. So, for example, we, we have data on obesity. Now, um, basically, you have to be very, very fat to be, very, to, to be affected by, by, by that you know, weight gain. Um, uh, Obese people aren't as miserable as people looking at them think they ought to be because they're looking at an obese person who thinks they're thinking about being obese all the time. When, of course, they're not. They're paying attention to other things. The arguments with the kids and the husband and the wife are still the same arguments. Watching the X Factor still feels the same. Um, and, and I think it's the same when we look through the policy lens. We look at people's lives and we think, oh, they're poor. Well, therefore, they must be miserable. Or, but actually, let's look at some of the other aspects of their lives. Actually, poverty does make people miserable, by the way. I think we shouldn't overstate that. Um, but the social connectedness is something that's often much harder to measure, and so we don't pay enough attention to it when we're looking at um, interventions to make people happier. Thank you. Hi. Um, ah, where are we? I'm here. Right. Sorry, we're left, right? Oh. <laughs> Hi. Ah. No, here. sorry, where, where, where are you? Um. <laughs> uh, okay, hello. Just stand up. No, hello, I can see you now. Okay, okay. <laughs> so in terms of measuring national well-being or happiness, I take yeah. it you're not very happy with the question, sort of how satisfied are you with your lives <laughs> and so forth. Um, what, well, since I wrote them? <laughs> do you think that a set of <laughs> questions asking people about the purpose to their lives or sort of centred around purposefulness um, would actually lead to a better set of data to analyse well-being? Or do you think people would just default to the you know, a scale give answer seven yeah. or to say neither satisfied nor satisfied, would that actually help the kind of data and quality of it that we'd get from the survey questions? So that's a really good question. So um, about well, however many years ago, three or four years ago, the ONS asked us to write questions for them to ask, uh, sorry, actually asked us to write a question, this is quite important, for them to ask in their national surveys. And the obvious contender was the life satisfaction question because that's been most widely used in most surveys. And I said, well, why not, why not ask two questions? Why not ask them a question about evaluation and ask a question about experience. Why not ask them how happy they were yesterday? Okay, we'll do two questions. <laughs> Great, you're doing two questions. How about, why don't you ask the third question? Why don't you, um, why don't you ask them how anxious they were yesterday? Because we want to get a negative emotion as well as uh, positive. Okay, we'll ask three questions. Brilliant, now you're asking three questions. Um, why don't you ask a question on how worthwhile are the activities that you engage in? So that kind of gets at the purpose thing. But I think in, on reflection, um, I think if I was asked to advise on writing those questions now, I would make them even more experiential. Because how happy, I actually, when I think about this now, it's kind of it's obvious, but um, how happy were you yesterday is actually quite an evaluative question. First of all, I have to reflect on yesterday, think about all, all the things I was doing, and summarise it in a number. So it's probably easier just to say seven. Um, and, the same with how, and, and the same with how anxious I, I felt um, yesterday. How, how worthwhile are the activities I engage in? That's kind of better because it's, it's, it is an evaluation, but it's, it's, a, it's, an easy, it's an e a relatively easy question to answer, I think. But um, m what I'd like to see much more of are, are um, surveys that ask about experiences of worthwhileness and purpose and meaning in the activities that people engage in uh, and not just an overall evaluative question. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so it's worth just saying, though. Can I just say, just say quickly something about data? We've got 20 minutes left, we've got bags of time. Um, the, again, with this evaluation experience distinction hat on, um, when we look at evaluations of happiness, including the four ONS questions, we find 
an association with age that is, that is clear across all data sets. Uh, it's basically U-shaped. Young people are happy, old people are happy, 46-year-old men like me are miserable. 46-year-old and male, that's about as bad as it gets. I can look forward to it getting better insofar as I live. Um, but when we look at experience data, the patterns are, are less clear. For some emotions, it's flat. For some emotions, things go in a non-monotonic way. It's, it's a very interesting and different set of uh, answers. When we looked at the American time use data, um, the ple pleasure and purpose profiles are broadly flat with age. That is, that is, there's not much of a difference by age. But there is for purpose in young people. And maybe it comes to the suicide question. I like joining questions up, even though I didn't know I was going to do that. Is to, is people of 17 to 23 report very low levels of purpose. Um, they then start reporting similar levels to, uh, as they get older. So um, it matters how we ask the questions and we get different associations. Yeah? Hello. 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 Talk. Thank I'm you. To ask a tricky question. I'm yeah. sorry about this. Um, I'm glad that you'll be focusing on data, but I'd like to ask your view yeah. of the problems that apparently exist with the statistical analysis of the data. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Brown, former employee of the Council of Europe, mm -hmm. uh, while taking the master's degree in positive psychology <coughs> at the University of East London, yes. decided that he disagreed with the statistical analysis and proved it, it was simply flawed. Yeah, it was some data that Barb Fredrickson and That's her co-author right. published, yeah, on the butterfly effect thing. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I know that very well, yeah. Uh, but, uh, in fact, it, it does draw to our attention that, that while I thought Barbara Fredrickson was wonderful, I, I'm now unsure whether I should be believing any of you. Yes, well... <laughs> No, no well, of course you can believe me. That's, a, that's an important point. So one thing we know from behavioural science is, uh, is, that, is that effective messengers um, are people that, are, that have authority, can be trusted, and are similar to us. So you can trust me. Um, the, um, one of the things that... So to talk about a different um, example, to bring it back to this one... There's been a lot of work on priming effects. That is, the unconscious drivers of our behaviour, like the buying the French wine because of the French music. But some of those effects, when they've tried to be replicated, don't hold up. Now, priming is a really subtle unconscious cue. So what Kahneman suggested is that um, rather than there, there be this kind of largely vitriol between these different research teams saying, yes, priming effects matter here, but no, they don't there, is for half a dozen labs to replicate each other's studies if a robust finding emerges across all six labs, say, then you can be pretty confident that that's a robust primary effect. I think we could probably do the same with analysis of data, is that you could have two or three different research teams look at the same data set, ask it the same questions, and see if they come to the same conclusions. I think that would, that would help. I can hear you. I can hear you, yes. Yes. Power and you have only pleasure and purpose. Once yeah. you the poverty, power and purpose, and then you introduce a third word, poverty. Mm. One of my um, great interests in life is how do you introduce purpose into the lives of people who are in extreme poverty? Mm -hmm. And we <coughs> know that the governments are talking about this all the time. That continually taking the funding away from activities which would give the poor and the unemployed a sense of purpose. Have you anything to say on that? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, it's it, a lot of these. A lot of these questions are not they're clearly not you know easy questions to answer, and and, and, and they're going to take a long time for us to to be able to answer them. Um, one of the things that uh, Cheek Sent Mahai, who's uh, who's uh, uh, a psychologist in the US, talks about is is flow. You know, being engaged in an activity, and you can do that in. For, for things that are quite mundane tasks. You can get flow and feel absorbed and engaged in an activity, even if it's a mundane task. So certainly, to improve the happiness of people uh, on lower, lower um, incomes, people who are poor, um, clearly you can find ways of, 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 of framing the experiences that bring more purpose in those experiences. Of course, the systemic challenge or the social policy challenge from that is that you might then entrench and embed inequalities because you basically then set, find, found ways of, of basically keeping the poor happy. Um, and that's a challenge. I mean, I don't know. That's, that's quite a difficult policy challenge to answer. I don't, I, don't, I don't have the answer here. But I think that 
what I do have the answer to is that at least we can be, be exploring the implications and the policy consequences of looking at, uh, looking at activities through a purpose lens as well as a pleasure one. Yeah, hello. Hello. Um, I wanted to ask about the correlation between focus and happiness. Focus? Uh, yeah, and in, yeah. Your, in your research, have you come across any universal tools that could be put across as a policy to help improve focus, particularly in children and young adults? Which we're very distracted, aren't we, in these, this day and age, social media and... Yeah, I'll turn the phone off. Turn the phone off. <laughs> turn the phone off. I mean, that's actually... I, I, actually, I actually say that quite seriously. Um, one of the things that... Uh, so, so the brain is lazy, right? So it wants to conserve attentional energy. And when you, when you switch between tasks, you're draining your brain of energy. So the idea, for example, that you can multitask is complete fallacy. We've always known that men can't do it, women can't do it either. Um, you're, much, you're much happier and much more productive when you stay focused on one thing at a time. So the critical challenge, which I'll talk about next, next year, is to, is to find ways of designing your environment to make it easier for you to stay focused on one activity at a time. And one of, one of the things to do is to turn your phone off <laughs> when you're engaged in social interactions, for example. I mean, um, the fact that you, know, you might be out for dinner with someone and, and they're checking their emails is not only rude, um, but it makes everyone miserable too. And so in, in schools and in learning environments, we need to find ways of, of helping children pay attention to what they're experiencing at the moment. I mean, the key thing for most of us is that we're nearly always happier when we're paying attention to what we're doing and who we're doing it with than allowing ourselves to be distracted either by virtual media or in other ways our mind wandering off elsewhere. So um, designing environments in the school and in your own lives to focus attention on what you're doing would help. Hello. Hello. Hi. 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 I was uh, interested in the link that you might uh, see between your concept of paying attention yeah. and that of mindfulness, which yes. I'm sure lots of people will have uh, come across, yes. um, and how that links with purpose uh, and how uh, you see that, how you link those two concepts, really, your, your yeah. two purposes yeah. uh, and, and mindfulness. No, thank you very much, and thank everybody for their questions. This, I, this is why I, I always like this bit so much more. Um, so mindfulness, it clearly, I mean, the evidence suggests that mindfulness works. I mean, the evidence certainly works for those people that carry on doing it, and it works for. Um, there are, of course, um, some obstacles and hurdles to engage in mindfulness to begin with and to carry on doing it. Um, sitting alongside mindfulness training, and this is not to put them as either or, is, again, it comes to the answer to the previous question, actually, is to kind of design environments in ways that help you pay attention to what you're doing and who you're doing it with. I mean, mindfulness is essentially about paying attention to the moment, really. I mean, that's, that's the kind of essence of it. So, so um, designing environments without having to go through mindfulness, without having to, to, to use System 2 effort. Can you, can you use System 2 effort to design an environment to allow System 1 to run free, paying attention to what it's doing? <laughs> and turning your phone off is one way to do that. Um, the purpose thing is um, interesting. I don't... I don't um, I don't, know, I don't know that I have a good answer to that question, actually, frankly, about the association between uh, mindfulness and purpose. I mean, I think it comes back to my earlier answer about weight, weight, about weight training and mindfulness, probably, is that the, the more you do something, the more you get engaged with something, the more you, you know, the, just the more you do it, probably it becomes increasingly purposeful. So insofar as you start mindfulness, stick with it, it becomes an increasingly purposeful activity, and the balance between pleasure and purpose therefore changes. Um, it becomes relatively more purposeful compared to pleasurable. Sorry. Hi. Hello, where, where are we? Left. Me again. Left. Really oh, hello. Sorry. Oh, God. Again? <laughs> I know. Bloody hell, this better be good. It is, I hope. <laughs> it is. I think I'll be the judge of that. Yeah, you be the judge. I'm two bites of the apple. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, regarding neurochemical illness, how do you believe that all the theories on happiness impact on severe neurochemical illness, like psychosis or extreme <coughs> paranoia or any of those? Um, and do you feel that they have a solid impact on people with neurochemical Im illness? Sorry, thank you. Well, interesting. So I don't know if I'm going to answer your question, but I'm going, to answer a, I'm going to answer a related question. One of the things that... And then maybe I might answer your question, if you're lucky. One of the things that... Um, in initially interested me in happiness research was having previously done a lot of work in health economics, valuing the impact of different conditions on people's lives. And the way that we did that was by asking people hypothetical questions about how they thought these things would impact upon them, 
expressed through willingness to give up life years in order not to be in these health conditions. And we found that um, from those hypothetical responses that being moderately anxious or depressed was about as bad as having some problems walking about. And, these, these, and this information is now used by regulatory agencies to inform the cost per quality, it's called, of healthcare interventions and whether Pfizer should have its new wonder drug re reimbursed. And um, if you just think about that for a second, moderate anxious, moderately anxious or depressed compared to some problems walking about, well, they probably do start off about as bad as each other to begin with. Um, for the first day. But insofar as some problems walking about doesn't have any pain associated with it, after about a week, a month, and certainly a year, you've got used to it. There's a lot of adaptation. There's a lot of withdrawal of attention. That's basically what adaptation is. Something that's novel and new to begin with becomes old and, old and established quite quickly. Whereas anxiety and depression, in contrast, and all the neurochemical conditions, as you, as you just termed them, are constant attention-seeking conditions. You don't get used to being depressed. Day 365 depressed is every bit as bad, maybe even worse than the first day was. So um, happiness data allow us, and this is more directly in answer to your question, allow us to look at the impact of different conditions on people's happiness without them asking to think how much they matter to them. Because when people do that, they pay undue attention to the initial change and not to the long-term consequences. We think some problems walking about will be, will, will be bad forever because we're paying attention to how much it matters now. And, and so they allow us to, um, to, 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 to look at all of the things that might affect people's happiness, insofar as we can ask questions about it in big surveys, allow the regression analysis to tell us the impact of these conditions, and then spend public money monies in ways that bring about the biggest happiness hit for the buck. Um, and in so doing, uh, many of the conditions, and of course there are some real challenges about classifications of uh, mental illnesses um, that, I'm, I'm, that I'm no expert on, that I don't, I don't want to get into here, but there are some challenges there. Um, but what it all, nearly always will do is to, is to lead to greater priority to mental health conditions because of their attention-seeking nature, and I think that's how it ought to be. Thank you. Hello. Uh, uh, hello. hello. Um, I've got the microphone, shall I go oh, ahead? Oh dear. I'd <laughs> Where is that? Here. <laughs> Where am I looking? Standing uh, up. Hello, hello. <laughs> hello, how are you? Are you happy? Are you seven out of ten? Yes, uh, better I've got this in my hand. <laughs> I've been trying. Um, as you probably know, many people will know that the New Economics Foundation has done a lot of work on well-being. Mm -hmm. And you've touched on several points uh, from their five ways to well-being. One of them is taking notice, making connections, doing something meaningful, learning something new. But also some years ago, they did their World Happiness Survey. And this brings up the first question about Denmark. And one of the most interesting findings was that smaller units, a lot of islands, for example, came out very high on the well-being index. And I'm wondering, in the light of the current results of the elections to the economic, um, e to the EU to parliament, whether the, one of the dissatisfactions that people are showing is this lack of connectedness, that we might have a policy um, movement towards more local engagement. Um, yeah, yes, I think it's probably the short answer to that question. Um, um, yes, you're broadly right. I think the, 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 the challenge, again, though, is it comes back to a little fortune cookie maxim that Kahneman has in... Thinking fast and slow is there's nothing in life is as important as you think it is whilst you're thinking about it. Uh, it's a focus and effect problem. Nothing in life is as important as you think it is whilst you're thinking about it. And when you're asked to pay attention to something, you think it matters because you're paying attention to it and you think you'll be paying attention to it in the experience of your life. And politics is quite a lot like that. Um, we, when we think about the impact of different policies, different political parties, we're thinking about that impact being important because we're paying attention to it. Um, to come to the earlier question, what I want to do is to look at those policies and politics in relation to experience data to see whether those things actually matter in people's lives when they're not thinking about it. Um, you know, so we know, for example, that um, uh, mental illness remains bad. It st starts bad and stays bad. But we've been looking at some of the data on, again, using life satisfaction data on the impact of the general elections 
um, we're just about to look at the 2010 one, which is much more interesting than the, than the three before, because the three before we knew the outcome pretty much when people went to the polls. But there's actually no effect of, of the outcome on anything, except I think in the three general elections before that, happy Tories were less likely to vote. Um. Hello. Oh, talking about politics. About Where are we? 60 years ago. Oh, Where are we? Uh, hello. About 60 years ago, Prime Minister Harold Macmillan yeah. said, you've never had it so good. Yeah. And since then, I can only see it's got better. Um, I, I've lived yeah. a longer, healthier, happier life, and I'm likely to carry on doing so. Yeah. With the National Health Service, I uh, had free education uh, into my early 20s, uh, social welfare benefits, uh, unemployment, housing benefits, if I needed them, I haven't, but... Uh, I've got them. Yeah. So, um, you know, am I unusual in sort of, perhaps I'm selfish, but why, why doesn't everybody in this country feel that they've won the lottery of life um, and living a life that many people in other parts of the world would give their right arm for? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I mean, one of the things... Um, okay, I mean, it's interesting about the expectations. It's about expectations in part, I think, is the, is, drives that answer. If it's sort of expectations exceed realizations, even if the realizations are increasing quite rapidly, then there's still a gap between them, and you might not feel happier. Um, uh, by the way, though, that doesn't mean that you should have low expectations, um, because optimists uh, um, are nearly always happier. What optimists do is they have they have high expectations, or they expect things to turn out well, but they don't they don't blame themselves or punish themselves when they turn out badly. Um, and they carry on regardless and then carry on doing things that are motivating. Um, so I think expectations might, might explain part of it. But of course, life expectancy gains, for example, there's no reason why you should feel happier in the moment because you're going to live another 20 years instead of another 15. So um, life expectancy, and I'm sure you'll live more than that. Um, but what, So what, what we would do, I think, is take the experience data and multiply it by life years so that you can show the impact of life expectancy gains on overall well-being but don't expect that to show up in people's day-to-day -day moods. Hi. Um, hello, where are we? Oh, hello. <laughs> You're one of the kids that make people miserable. Of course he does. <laughs> um, my question is, though it draws attention to something, does, yes. it help, does talking the bad things through help to make overall happiness better, though it draws attention to it? Brilliant, that's a fantastic question, because I can answer it brilliantly. Um, <clears throat> so one of the things, here's, here's, really, here's, a, really, here's a really important um, insight from science that doesn't get through, carried through into policy. Um, after a traumatic event, um, the, twi the Twin Towers coming down is a very nice example. There's an assumption that people are really experiencing an awful amount of grief and pain and suffering from that. So we need to offer a solution to it, and we need to offer a solution quickly. And we offer post-traumatic therapies. Now, what they do is that they essentially lock in emotions that people are feeling at, at the time, which are negative and bad, and they persist over time. Those interventions are harmful. What we should, and the evidence is clear on this, what we should instead be doing is, is offering light-touch interventions. Get people to write down how they're feeling get the feedback themselves over the course of a few days, weeks, weeks, weeks or months. And then the adaptation process is kicking. So talking helps, but not false talking. <laughs> talking helps if it's done in a, in a, in a, in a very light touch, non-invasive, non-intrusive kind of way. So that the natural adaptation processes, I didn't talk about adaptation too much, but that's the withdrawal of attention, as I said earlier, that actually most, most of the things that life throws at us we get over. It doesn't mean that they don't have an, 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 an um, impact, and, and it doesn't mean that that impact isn't real. But there's something comforting, I think, in the idea that it's going to get better. Hi. Hello. Hello. 51 Maybe, seconds. Oh, great. OK. Maybe the people in the Philippines are more happy because it's warmer there than what it is in <laughs> Russia. <laughs> yes. So, and personally, I feel that summer is much better for me than winter. So do you have any research on Brilliant. weather? Brilliant. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that question. I'll answer that in 32 seconds. So Danny Kahneman and, Dan and David Scarday, the focus and effect problem comes from a paper that they had published on Are Californians Happier? Where Californians and Midwesterners were asked how happy they were, and they were also asked how happy they thought the other state was, area was. Californians and Midwesterners both thought that Californians were happier. Why? Because what makes those two places different is the weather. The happiness reports of the Californians and the Midwesterners were no different. 
Why? Because if it's sunny every day, you get used to it. What draws attention to it? You know, if it's 70 degrees, <laughs> great, it's California again, right? Um, if the weather, if you, the, 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 the only times in some of the data, and there's been lots of work done on this, and I'm, I'm, I'm not involved in this myself personally, but my understanding is that it's, again, it's the extremes that draw attention to themselves. If you have a, a really great day in the midst of winter, that's good. And if you had a really bad day in the midst of summer, that's bad. But most of the time, weather doesn't affect our well-being. But we think it does, because when we think about it, we're paying attention to it impacting upon us. <laughs> and that is zero. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.